whose great understanding and guidance has helped not only South Africa, but the world through crisis after crisis for half a century. And now in the Flutkirk Pretoria, mortal remains of Jan Christian Smuts, patriot, soldier, statesman, fearless leader and faithful friend. Today the world pays homage for the last time Eight generals who are to be his pallbearers enter the church and all around the crowd stands dreamily giving way to silent grief. Then to the good kirk came the chief mourners, including members of his family. With them, the thoughts of his widow who was unable to attend. The service was broadcast and loudspeakers brought it to those outside, some of whom followed it, as many did in distant farmhouses, docks and cities. Leaving the church, the coffin is borne by eight sergeant majors to be placed on the 25-pounder gun that will streets of Pretoria on its way to the railway station. Time and again, thoughts turn to Mrs. Smuts, keeping her lonely vigil a few miles away at the farm Dornclue. Her wreath is the only one on the coffin. The pallbearers take up their station, then slowly the procession starts the greatest military funeral South Africa has ever known. Soon the enormous cortege enters Church Square, moving along with measured tread. In hushed silence along the two-mile route, thousands were overcome by emotion at the sight of the coffin bearing the field marshal's cap and sword and that single wreath, followed by his decorations and his charger with boots and spurs reversed. From time to time, the procession returned to the slow march. Over 1,500 members of the armed forces took part, while another 1,500 lined the route, and all along its length, every vantage point was crowded, with South Africans paying their last respects. Words falter in giving adequate expression to the great loss we have sustained. This great military funeral nears its final stage as it heads towards the station. From there the body will be taken to Johannesburg for cremation. But now it enters the station square, which is dominated by the statue of the President of the Transvaal Republic, the late Paul Kruger, the man whom General Smuts served so faithfully over half a century ago.
Followed by people wishing to participate in Johannesburg's last tributes, the funeral train soon arrives at Irene, where General Smuts lives. And here at the place in Africa, where he often found peace and rest during his crowded life, it halted. At Irene there were displays of mass grief, as at all other stations along the route. Genuine mourning for the man South Africa called the Oba. The sad journey ends in Johannesburg, and from now on it becomes a private funeral, with the chief mourners bearing the coffin. Never have Johannesburg streets been crowded with so many people, and never its people so deeply moved with agonizing emotion. Arrangements had been made for as many voluntary and ex-servicemen's organizations as possible to participate. The hearse moved through the great city streets, past the city hall, where General Smuts made his last public appearance. Then on towards Brumfontein Cemetery for the cremation. Here once again it came to hallowed ground. Floral tributes from kings and queens and commoners the world over were amongst those of his friends. To quote the words of the Bishop of Johannesburg, we do honor to the memory of a great South African, a great citizen of the world, a great man. His character and his service to humanity provide his most fitting epitaph. When we look back on the life that has just ended, we can shed all personal feelings and recognize the true stature of the man himself. Jan Christian Smut, Order of Merit, Privy Councillor, Companion of Honour, Decorasi for Troadins, Croix de Guerre, Commander of the Legion of Honour, Grand Commander of the Order of Leopold, Fellow of the Royal Society, Chancellor of the University of Cambridge, Chancellor of the University of Cape Town. The Smuts legend starts outside Malmesbury in the Cape Province for it was here that he was born on the farm Beauclerc. Had they been present to hear the pulings of an infant on May the 24th, 1870, who could have imagined they were hearing the first utterances of a man who was to earn the respect of the whole civilized world? With a childhood spent in such typically lovely surroundings, there's little wonder that he developed a deep and abiding love of South Africa. At the age of 16, he entered Victoria College, Stellenbosch, where he graduated as a Bachelor of Arts at the age of 21. This interesting photograph shows him as a handsome young man of 20, was a fellow student who was later to become one of his cabinet ministers, the late F.S. Milan. In 1891, he became an undergraduate of Christ's College, Cambridge, where he gained a double first law tripos. Returning to South Africa, he married Sibylla Margarita Kricher and at the age of 29 became State Attorney of the Transvaal Republic under Paul Kruger. He had already embraced a guiding philosophy that he maintained throughout his life. It was with this faith that he became a Commando General in the South African War, earning a reputation as a fearless and resourceful leader in 1908, as Colonial Secretary of the Transvaal, he attended the National Convention, where, with General Louis Borta and John X. Merriman, he laid the foundations of union. On September 20, 1909, the South Africa Act was passed through both houses of the British Parliament. And less than a year later, on May 31, 
1910, the Union of South Africa became self-governing. South Africa's first Prime Minister was the late General Louis Botha. In his cabinet, the late General J.B. Herzog became Minister of Justice. The portfolio of defence was given to General Smart, who set about organising the Union Defence Force. Within a few years, the First World War had begun, and to the young and as yet untried Union Defence Force fell the task of conquering first German South West Africa and later German East Africa. Simultaneously, the South African Brigade was acquitting itself with distinction in France, a fact which made South Africa's war efforts seem less remote. Appointed a member of the Imperial War Cabinet in 1917, General Smuts recommended the amalgamation of the Army and Navy Air Arms into the present Royal Air Force. He also arranged for the unity of command in France. Following the armistice, Boerter and Smuts attended the peace conference at Versailles. In August 1919, Louis Boerter returned home to receive an enthusiastic official welcome at the Union building. Boerter's tremendous labours during the war had left him exhausted and within a few days, the nation was mourning his death. General Louis Botha, of whom it will always be said, he was a great South African. Hurrying back from Versailles to take over the leadership of the government, Smuts too was accorded an official welcome. While at Versailles, he had, at the request of President Wilson of the United States, drafted the covenant of the League of Nations, forerunner of the present United Nations organization. To his broad conception of the dignity and independent rights of the widely scattered peoples of the British Empire, we owe the expression, the Commonwealth of Nations. In the crowd, wearing a white plumed hat, Mrs. Smuts quietly shared her husband's acclaim. If Smuts had inherited the mantle of premiership left by Louis Botha, he had also inherited the leadership of a country that seethed with bitter and conflicting opinions. With typical energy, he set about reconciling the divergent interests of town and country and urging closer understanding between English and Afrikaans-speaking South Africans. Among the burghers he had led on commando, he found many that were prepared to follow him along the road to cooperation and development. But there were many who disagreed with his policies, and the forces of opposition gathered strength. His 1923 cabinet, of which his erstwhile fellow student F.S. Milan was a member, joined him when he felt compelled to resign. On October the 30th, 1924, General J.B.M. Herzog became Prime Minister, with Mr. N.C. Harbinger as his Minister of Finance. As leader of the opposition, General Smut still remained a public figure, participating in the events that constituted the lives of the people. As a philosopher, General Smuts in 1925 published his book called Holism and Evolution. To quote his own words, wholeness is the key to thought. And when we take that view, we shall be able to read much more of the riddle of the universe. To some people, such lofty conceptions made him aloof, setting him aside from the requirements of bread and butter politics. It may even be true that there was only one person who completely knew and understood him. But it's abundantly clear that he was equally at home with any part of the country's life. In the year 1930, General Herzog attended the Imperial Conference in England. Following the Wall Street crash the year before, the economic structure of the world was threatened and South Africa was entering a depression. England went off the gold standard and one country after another followed. The Minister of Finance, Mr. Harbinger, 
bore the brunt of the Union government's decision to remain on gold. The crisis was hitting the voters' pockets. With the government's popularity on the wane, people again turned their hopes to General Smuts. Outside the field of politics, he maintained a genial attitude that showed little trace of the deep concern with which he surveyed the future. With neither of their parties capable of governing by itself, General Herzog and General Smuts formed a coalition. This decision was welcomed by the voters in 1933 and confirmed, after five years of increasing progress, again in the elections of 1938. With General Herzog as Prime Minister and General Smuts as Deputy Prime Minister, the wheels of industry hummed and the Union prospered. But once again, the fair skies of Africa began to cloud with another crisis. In Europe, a maniac unleashing the dogs of war. In South Africa, no stranger to war's horrors, General Smuts faced with a fateful decision. Within a few days, General Herzog's ministry was ended his neutrality proposals defeated. With the world in a state of upheaval, General Smuts, at the age of 69, assumed the premiership and formed his war cabinet. Caught completely unprepared, South Africa set about mobilizing its forces. The cream of the nation's manhood, equipped only with the will to resist the threat of brutal tyranny, began to be molded into an effective fighting force. Within a matter of months, General Smuts, as Commander-in-Chief, bade farewell to the 1st Division before it left to perform such magnificent feats in Abyssinia and the Middle East under the inspired leadership of the late Major General Dan Pienaar. In 1941, he was raised to the rank of Field Marshal, the only South African to be so honoured, and received his baton from the Governor-General, the late Sir Patrick Duncan. As we record the recognition of his services, let us acknowledge with gratitude the wonderful work of Mrs. Smuts. She devoted herself to the welfare of soldiers' dependents, spreading warmth and affection. With a spontaneous feeling of love, she called those in the fighting forces, my boys, and they with equal warmth called her Omar. Quite late in the war, General Smuts watched commando training when he visited the battle school. Though it differed from the commandos of his early days, he was proud to see that the tough core of manhood still thrived. There had never in his mind been any doubt as to the sterling qualities of his people. South Africa had sent three divisions to fight overseas and had made their fighting equipment. The Unite for Victory parade held in June 1943 was more than an inspiring spectacle. It was a complete vindication of his own policies. In spite of ups and downs, success has crowned our efforts beyond our fondest hopes. And our name is mentioned with honor wherever the story of this war is told. Smuts had led, the people had followed. Frequent flights between the Union and the shifting theatres of war were the penalties of conscientious leadership. Even his closest colleagues were amazed at the tireless energy with which he combined the duties of the Prime Minister with those of the Commander-in-Chief of his forces. The 6th Armoured Division was ready for the invasion of Italy.
he conferred in North Africa with General Ike Eisenhower and General Alexander. It's interesting to remember that he had championed unity of command in World War I, a strategy that was again to prove so successful with Eisenhower at the head. His opinions were valued in the major war conferences, particularly by Mr. Winston Churchill. Winston Churchill, as the British Prime Minister, extended to him the honour and privilege of addressing both houses of the British Parliament. With honesty and sincerity on our part, it is possible to make basic reforms both for national and international life, which will give mankind a new chance of survival and of progress. Let this program, by no means too ambitious, be our task. And let us already now, even in the midst of war, begin to prepare for it. And may heaven's blessing rest on our work in war and in peace. And I ask you, all of you, to signify your feelings by rising and giving him the acclamation which his character, his life's work, equally deserves. The applause and acclamation followed him to Italy, where he visited the Springboks. To them, he was a symbol of integrity and wisdom. At last, after six weary years, came victory. Before the cheering died down, General Smut set about building the peace. Thoughts of relaxation he cast aside. In San Francisco, he signed the United Nations Charter on behalf of South Africa, then returned to the Union. And amid scenes that bear a remarkable resemblance to Borta's and his own homecomings after the First World War, he rallied a country still licking its wounds to bend itself afresh to peacetime problems. Our times lie ahead of the world. A world destroyed by war as never before. Such is the new world which Hitler has left behind for us. But at any rate, it is not a slave world. It is a world of free men in which they will shape their own destiny. What reason could we have? What greater reason could we have we leave the realm of politics and come to that day in 1947 when the royal family went up Table Mountain during their tour. And waiting to act as host on his beloved mountain was General Smuts, who as usual had climbed up on foot. And in sharp contrast to this informal simplicity, we turn to the pomp and ceremony of his installation as Chancellor of Cambridge University. A scholar, a scientist, a soldier and a statesman. Honours were showered on him and he accepted them all with gratitude and humility. To Johannesburg, which he had watched grow from a mining camp to the Union's biggest city, fell the honour of rejoicing with him on the eve of his 80th birthday. At the city hall, as he was greeted by his worship the mayor, he was surrounded by friends from all walks of life. Then, with the same old spring in his step, the same keen eye, the same upright bearing, he inspected the guard of honor. In front of the city hall, his worship the mayor hung the badge of a freeman of the city of Johannesburg round his neck, a moment that received the human touch when the badge itself became awkward. With the old fighting spirit, he exhorted South Africa to face the future with hope, fearlessness and vigour. This was no old man talking. And when he returned to the scene that night, there was nothing to indicate that he was entering the twilight of his life and that we would see him no more. He loved South Africa. He referred to Table Mountain as his cathedral. So let us once again accompany him to its lofty peaks where we shall always feel his abiding spirit. Goodbye, Oba. In the midst of beauty, once again you seek the heights, 
leaving those you love behind you. Step by step you climb, throwing off the mortal coil and the cares and restrictions of a mortal world. The world you leave has endowed you with rich honors and with you, South Africa. Amidst it all, you still love simplicity, the true things of nature and of God. Here the spirit shall soar and be free. What more fitting place then than in nature's great cathedral for us to say farewell, O oh